Hello. I'm trying to. Mm, nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> yes. Nice. <laughs> they look good on you. <laughs> How are you doing today? Fantastic. Thank you. Good. Good. I'm glad I can uh, get on the call. I know, right? Yes, technology working. <laughs> We're all here. It's going to be great. <laughs> Yay. Hello, everyone. Good Hi, afternoon. Diana. Bye. <laughs> we got some nice weather out there. Mm -hmm. I think yep. it's perfect. It's like 80 degrees, no much hotter than that. It's all good. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Just perfect. Just perfect. I was in Utah two weeks ago and it was 120 degrees. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's hot. <laughs> that's what I call training weather. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. So we're we're coming in here. Looking for Izzy, not necessarily seeing Izzy here yet. And James. Hi Kari. Hi, Michael. Hello. Good Hi. afternoon. Hi. Good to see you all. Uh, I know that Phil Ditzler is unavailable. He's traveling today. Hi, Ismail. All right. Well, I think we should go ahead and get going. If, if you don't mind, everyone, pretty please, turn on your camera so we can um, wonderful screenshot of our services. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. We'll get this wonderful party started here. You know, we didn't have Jermaine in that picture. There we go. You want to try? Uh oh. Jermaine? I do. Sorry, I, do. I was. Uh, do that again. Yeah, I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> and a man. That's fabulous. Thank you, everyone. Big smiles. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm going to share. So welcome to our third uh, committee meeting. I'm Christine Moses, your facilitator. And it is such an honor to be here today. Thank you so much. Um, so let's get started. So we're gonna listen and learn uh, through reflection and discussion today. Please share your insights. It's really critical that you bring all of you to the table. Um, we'll frame the work of the committee by reviewing our proposed changes to the committee uh, charter, charter itself, Learn about the history of planning and construction in the I-205 corridor, and we'll discuss underserved and underrepresented communities that could be proportionately affected by the I-205 tool project. Um, and we will also uh, look to the equity framework, um, step one in the draft equity 
we can ultimately craft policy suggestions for the Oregon Transportation. So welcome. Our entire meeting, as usual, um, will be recorded today. Again, here is Brett's number down here, the 206 number. If you have technical difficulties, please make sure you jot down his number and then you can text him. He'll be able to help you and make sure sure that um, you have a great experience today. Um, so again, we'll be recording the entire meeting. What you say is part of the public record. And the recording will be available at the end of uh, this week, beginning of next week. And then you can always go find about the project at oregontolling.org. And um, Community members, you're always welcome to email your, your public comments to the Oregon Tolling at odot.state.or.us. So our agenda for today, action packed. We always start with our welcome, uh, then we'll have public comment, committee member report out. I'll be asking you every meeting to spend a little bit of time. And I think what I'm gonna do is like pick like three people this meeting, three people next meeting um, to make sure that everybody has a voice, but we wanna hear what you're hearing from your community. We're gonna look at the charter with uh, the charter language. Then we're gonna look at the draft toll projects equity framework, just a teeny bit um, we're just going to mention it today. We're going to spend more time on that at our next meeting in September. And we're going to look at how did we get here. Um, HB 2017 overview, just a really high level cursory overview. Then we'll look at the equity framework and identify communities that could be disproportionately affected by the I-205 project. And then we'll look at next steps. So. I always love to start by acknowledging um, and centering the traditional native inhabitants of the land upon which we live. I want to respectfully acknowledge the Chinook, the Clackamas, the Clackskanai, the Kalapulia, the Multnomah, the Malala, the Tillamook, and the Siletz people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. I pay my personal respects to their elders, both past and present. I, always, I also love to start our meetings uh, with a big deep breath. So I invite you to close your eyes or gaze softly downward. Feel the chair under your legs. Breathe in deeply through your nose. Hold for a moment and then breathe out your mouth. Feel your hands in your lap. Breathe in deeply through your nose. Hold and breathe out your mouth slowly. Feel your feet on the ground. Breathe in through your nose deeply. Hold. And breathe out your mouth. Slowly open your eyes. Welcome into our room. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for that. I also love 
to start us off with the reflecting back. So I'm going to give us two minutes on the timer to journal and to write down your reflection um, about the last meeting that we had talking about the I-205, I-5 equity framework and what are two perspectives that you learned about that you did not hold before. So I would like to give you two minutes to be able to do that. And I will set the stopwatch and go right ahead. Ten seconds. Okay, two minutes. Thank you. I always like to invite you to think back to where we were. Also, these notes are really important as we move forward. And especially this evening when we have a packed agenda, you're going to be jotting notes down as you go along and then we'll have discussion later. So just wanna give you a heads up to that. Again, our working agreements, we'll always take a look at these, listen, believe and reflect. Um, very, really critical um, skills to have in this process accept non-closure for the moment because we are in a long process. Be sure to speak your truth with compassion for yourself as well as, as, well as for others in the room. Listen to understand, don't listen to respond, which is uh, you know something that I continue to work on myself. Value and celebrate each other's experiences. We bring so much to the table. This committee is so amazing. I'm, I, I just, I, I love and value and celebrate all of your talents with an open heart and an open mind in order to explore all of the different possibilities that we're gonna be able to bring to the table. Space. Be concise in your words. Bring your best thinking into the room and be sure to attack the problem and not the person. And we will um, have disagreements and frustrations and differences of opinions that will be acknowledged, explored and addressed. So thank you for that. Um, I will begin to uh, bring us over into public comment. Um, so Penny, um, 
Do we have any people who would like to participate in public comment? The public comment time is two minutes. And if you're on the phone and want to raise your hand, please use star nine. I have Are one there any people? I do have one person's hand is up. Okay, so I will stop. In order for you to be able to share the timer and to promote that person to be able to give them a comment time. Okay, so I'm going to allow Charles Ormsby, who has his hand up, to talk. Go ahead, Charles. Wonderful, Charles. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yes. uh, my name is Charles Ormsby. I live uh, here in, in the Northeast quadrant of Lake Oswego. My concern with your committee is uh, outreach to neighborhood uh, groups along in the uh, uh, Highway 43 travel shed. Another concern is access uh, and mobility of people in wheelchairs. I'm a former caregiver uh, for my mother. Uh, she passed last year and I was caring for her 24 by seven uh, for 10 years. And she was bed bound and so she was traveling in a wheelchair and TriMet. This committee needs to know about a couple of things. First off, you need to have definition of mobility between points of accessibility. The best way to do that these days, in my estimation, is use uh, to specify your maps utilizing Google Map Plus codes. Plus codes for short, it's also referred to as open location code. This essentially gives you a grid down to about the one meter square area and nomenclature to get there. You need to make your maps do that. You also need to make tra uh, travel plans to simulate travel of a TriMet bus between University of Portland on the North Terminus all the way through Lake, uh, downtown Portland, Lake Oswego, Westland, and terminating in uh, Oregon City Transit Center and, and then travel to the Clackamas County headquarters. You should also take a look at doing a trip between, call it Metro headquarters and ODOT headquarters in Salem. Uh, that way you really begin to understand the issue of regional mobility and how this project tolling of I-205 and uh, diversion routes on Highway 43 will impact us. Uh, so there's a lot of other things going on, but neighbors need to be aware and people that have mobility access issues via wheelchair need to be addressed by, by this committee. I hope that it will be done so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir, thank you for that. Christine, I do not have any other hands raised. Okay. Then let's go ahead and move on. I appreciate that. So, Lucinda, I know that you're in there. I am here. Um, <laughs> yes, there you are. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I got lost there for a second. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot and I'm going to ask you to introduce our new commissioner if you don't mind. I don't mind. I'll introduce our commissioner and give her a moment so she can do an introduction to all of you. So I believe I sent out an email. All of you should have received an email. Um, commissioner Smith is with us now. We have um, Commissioner Vice Chair Simpson overbooked really but we have a replacement, it's Commissioner Smith. I'm gonna give her a moment to introduce herself. So you guys have the email already. Thank you, Lucinda. And well, it's really great to be here, everyone. Um, I'm looking forward to getting to know you a little bit more. And I, I um, kind of blanch at the thought of replacing Orlando because he's kind of irreplaceable. Um, I'm fairly new to the commission. I was appointed last September obviously brand new to this committee and and I'm very, very happy to be here. I hope I can um, be a contributing member of the committee. As we get started, my role I think is to listen because I haven't been involved. And so I will be quiet and, and listen and, and hear what you all have to say and try and get up to speed. I live in Bend, so I'm on the east side of the mountains and you know, I, I, I need to learn because 
I don't experience um, the same thing that you all do in the metro area on a day-to-day -day basis. I've been to Portland, I've driven to Portland, I understand the challenges and <clears throat> I'm especially mindful of uh, the accessibility issues that were raised in public comment. So my goal today and for the next little while is to listen and learn from you. And I'm very happy to be here. Right. Listen, Lucinda, Christine, back to you. To have you here. <laughs> we're, we're so excited to have you here. Thank you so much. We, we really appreciate it. Fantastic. All right, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen because we want to talk about if there are any um, outstanding questions, if we want to uh, discuss any outstanding questions or, or requests for follow-up from the July meeting or any discussion on comments received for the last meeting or for this meeting. So public comments, I just sent those to you an hour ago um, related to this meeting. So um, I'm opening the floor to see if there's any discussion. I think it would be good for me to, again, stop sharing so we can see raised hands um, and see if there's anybody who wants to have a conversation about anything that they've read or heard. James, let's start with you. James Paulson. Thank you very much. Hey, I um, read through the public comments um, and I was wondering um, how those are being recorded and if they're being like recorded in any which way that they might be able to be searched or if they're being categorized, just how that, what's taking place there. So Penny and I are working on that as a committee along with Josh and several other people. So Penny, um, I think you and I can have that conversation, can let people know. Public comments coming in through the, through the, there's many just different ways we're capturing public comments and turning them in, into a searchable database. Is that true? Yeah, yes. We're, Penny? We're, yes, all of the comments through the whole process are being captured um, and uh, they will be available, they will be categorized, they will be summarized. Yeah, so there will be all kinds of reporting. They will be available to you, James. We're just we're capturing them as they come in. Yeah. Yeah, because I know when I was going through those, the, there were a number of comments that I thought, you know, had um, various things that I thought were some important questions and things to bring up and just not sure about the timing and when to address those. That's That was my biggest concern. Because I, I, I mean, I can see that a lot of people put a lot of time and energy into those public comments that they wrote out. And I want to make sure that we're respective of people's um, time and energy. So I think that is a process for this committee to decide on how you want to do that, on how you want to make sure those, they get raised up, they get addressed, um, building time into each of our meetings specifically to address public comment is an absolute possibility if that's what you want as a committee. So I, I open the floor to be able to have that conversation. And, and just to clarify, Christine, you're talking about comments that come to this committee because Correct. We're collect, the project is collecting comments across the whole host of different ways. Right, exactly. Okay. We're in the middle of the 45 day comment period, which has about 2000. Um, mm, mm, I don't want 2000 comments. More? <laughs> yeah, okay, Lucinda's saying more. <laughs> Anna's saying more. So there are thousands of comments that uh, ODOT is receiving in that engagement process, specifically for the committee. Yes, you have several uh, comments that you can take a deeper dive into. 
it is about building time into these either these meetings or through a facilitated email process that you want to raise those comments up and say we should talk about them so that may be a process that may be a way to do that it's yeah, too for me what stood ahead. out just to get some detail is when i was reading through it i read um comments that were and i'm paraphrasing of course um asking a if this project is still important because of the change in um use of the freeway and then when i look at the materials that you provided for this meeting and we're talking about the modeling and so forth you know it's like when did that modeling take place um i don't believe that anyone could have told the future when they're building a model whenever that model was built and so that really um for me was a point of where public comment and the content of this meeting kind of crossed mm -hmm. yeah and we um odot has been doing the modeling over the last year and a half and now we're in a very different place um and and so i I think the best thing to do is to hear the information today, hear what the modeling is saying, and then at the end, let's talk about it. Like, let's have a, a, a deeper discussion about how, where we are now and with what information came and when that came to us. Is that okay, James? Yeah. Okay. My only thing Anyone is, else? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I just don't want to go on a super deep dive into a, a modeling discussion when I think that we're going to have to go back through that modeling again. I mean, I could see where we're like, let's, I mean, there's four models that we have to kind of take a look at or approaches, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'd rather go yep. at a higher level than go real deep considering what work is still in front of the model. Right. right, and we are at the 15,000 foot. We're not at the 30,000, we're at the 15,000 foot today, right? And we're not down in the weeds. <laughs> so, so we're somewhere here in the middle and then we can say, yes, no, we like this, we don't like this. But, and, and again, we are looking at being able to uh, deliver recommendations to the OTC um, through this equity framework. And we'll be able to nuance that as we go forward. So thank you, James. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Okay, let's go ahead and, and move ahead. So as a committee, have you been hearing from your constituencies or your communities? Any, any word on the street? I'm gonna stop sharing and come back into, all right, James. Well, I know when you sent out the um, information to kind of push that on about the uh, survey and so forth, um, I didn't get a lot of response from folks. Um, and just, I guess I got some comment on um, people not being enthusiastic about this project. Thank you for that. Thank you for that feedback. Anybody else hearing things from their constituents? Abe? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I was trying to find the raise my hand button. I used my actual hand. And I, <laughs> I right there. 
Um, but just in general, at a very high level, there's um, a lot of talk about diversion impacts in Clackamas and the nearby cities around the corridor. Um, with a lot of folks hearing that people are just going to avoid the tolls and then use um, bypass roads. And then um, concerns about impacts to businesses and residents and um, Thank you. We'll, we'll be looking at that later on this afternoon. Yes. And Penny, I see that there are two people that have their hands raised. Dr. Wu, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I, I happen. To, yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I happen to, yes, I'm gonna get that. to have a uh, uh, sort of a, a casual conversation with the uh, the transportation director out at the Rosewood Initiative, uh, which is sort of in the heart of the Rosewood neighborhood, which is uh, East Burnside and Southeast 162nd. So it's a pretty uh, it's a pretty diverse, underserved community, uh, but with some organization to it. Uh, but it was interesting because this transportation director for the Rosewood Initiative actually said. Um, uh, that in general, um, he was actually quite favorable to um, congestion pricing. Uh, and then, of course, was uh, mirroring some of the comments that we have all made about, you know, how do you make it equitable and what are the impacts. But in general, he was quite positive. And in a way, that actually surprised me. So I thought I would just mention that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank Christine, you very much. Christine, this is Penny. I just wanted to note that we do have two audience or uh, uh, attendees um, hands up, but we are, and my understanding is we are not calling on audience members, correct? We're confining the discussion to the members of the committee. That is correct. And so I want to apologize to the people who have raised their hand but are unable to participate at this point. And so again, I ask that you pretty please go to the website and give us your comments there. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Uh, Michael. Hi, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to, to share in general that um, when um, PBOT um, hears from community and we're doing different um, listening sessions or engagement on a variety of projects. Uh, we hear over and over again that safety is a big issue. Um, racial inequities are a big issue in the transportation system and climate is also a concern. And so um, in general, you know, we see that pricing has the potential to address a lot of these um, challenges and concerns. And so I think there's um, there's energy and, um, you know, thought being given to like, how can this be done in a way that advances those goals and concerns? Very good. Thank you so much for that. Bill? Wonderful, Bill. I think the general consensus of Southwest Washington residents is they're against tolls. And if there is tolling, how to make sure that's equitable for Southwest Washington. Um, I think a lot of people wouldn't be too pleased to see um, toll funding from the metro area be used in other parts of the state in Oregon, where they wouldn't have direct benefit from it. And then in sort of a different vein, um, other equitable options for people with disabilities, such as transit, um, they sort of force people who use wheelchairs into a one size fits all. And if you don't fit that one size fits all, you're sort of left out. So thinking of larger size mobility devices, recumbent bicycles, stuff like that. Um, so that's something to be aware of. What are other equitable options for people with disabilities instead of forcing them into whatever fits within a current um, paratransit vehicle? Thank Very you. good. Thank you so much, Bill. I appreciate that. And then Eduardo. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, it was difficult to solicit feedback because this uh, campaign also started around the same time that the um, information campaign for the replacement of the Trunnion the, on the I-5 bridge. Uh, so those were 
those are definitely a competing messages. Um, and especially when you're trying to connect with um, underrepresented communities, like it's, uh, it's difficult to convey both of those messages at the same time. And, de and definitely for the residents of Southwest Washington, I don't know if Diane and Bill have a different perspective, but I have seen a lot more about the, the Trunnion replacement than I have um, the, the tolling project. So just something to consider. That is great feedback. Thank you so much. Wonderful. So appreciate this part of the conversation. We will be um, going through lots of information today, but I want to be able to build in these types of conversations. So thank you so much for bringing those forward. I'm gonna go ahead and share again. And we are going to go into our committee process. I um, really appreciate the, the conversation that we had last time because we brought up trauma-informed and we brought up COVID-19. Um, and so uh, Abe and Diana and I met and talked about um, draft charter language for a trauma-informed approach. And believing that in that approach, we'd be able to address many of the COVID-19, um, the, the influence and the development that it has, that it's influencing in our processes, especially for equitable engagement. So I have asked Diana to give us a, a high level primer of what trauma-informed means. And she's with the League of United Latin American Citizens and the Latino Youth Conference. Um, she has deep experience in trauma-informed practices, and she's going to present about what it means to be trauma-informed when you're doing community outreach. So, Diana, I'm going to give you the floor, and I'm going to give you your first slide. How does that sound? Yeah, great. Thank you, Christine, for that introduction. And then also, I know I have... Um, so many minutes, and I can talk forever. So please, with okay, all I'll... confidence, cut me off. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I will. <laughs> okay. You're done. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you so much. Uh, again, thank you, Christine, for that introduction. Um, first and foremost, I just got to preface that uh, I am learning just like everyone else. I am. I am no. I don't consider myself an expert. I. I am a lifelong learner of this work. And every time I dive into these types of these, these conversations, I learn um, more about, about the uh, approach um, and, and how to um, not only walk in the space, but also the lens that we, we have to be very intentional, um, that we, we must see um, our uh, communities um, in terms of how we engage, how we seek information, um, and so you know, and 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 honor their perspectives as well. So, um, just to preface a little more about um, my work, um, um, as a founder of the Clark County Latino Youth Leadership Organization, we were uh, working in a partnership with uh, uh, LULAC and uh, the Latino Community Resource Group and with um, the NAACP of Vancouver um, on the 2020 census. Um, and, you know, we all experienced that moment in time where the world halted because of the pandemic and we had to pivot um, our work from census to how are we going to mitigate the, con the, the impacts of COVID-19 to our uh, BIPOC uh, Latinx communities, knowing that um, because of our experience and, and also history, know that um, dominant culture organizations, um, big systems were not and, and were not and still not um, uh, um, um, in, in a space to respond to our uh, BIPOC and Latinx uh, families with uh, trusted messaging and information and resources and support. And Diana, Diana, 
yes. BIPOC, define BIPOC, please. Oh, black indigenous people of color. Very good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for thank you for calling me out on that because <laughs> you know I just assume that everyone knows. And, and thank right. you for that. Um, and so we were very um cognizant, very intentional about how we are going to approach this work to address COVID in our communities in Southwest Washington with um, the, the organizations I mentioned. And one, one of the fundamental approaches of, of trauma-informed is the authentic, the authentic voice and the authentic process, uh, uh, transparent processes um, that are required um, to, to um, connect and engage um, with Latinx and BIPOC communities. So the model begins and ends with community voice, simple as that. Specifically people who live, who have lived experience, who live in the community, who speak the language of the community and, and identify um, as members of those communities, that they are part of that audience. Um, and so can we move on to the next screen? Sure please? can. Mm -hmm. So our approach is we asked them what they needed. Um, we know that each community um, has expertise, wisdom, experience. Um, we identified community stakeholders and through uh, our leaders and influencers in, in, in communities um, and identified not only their needs, their values and their priorities at the issues of hand and how to um, address COVID. Um, through our process, we were trans uh, we offered transparency. Um, we knew the information from trusted community stakeholders was trustworthy information and, and, and just as important, aligned the messaging with the stated needs from specific communities. Whereas uh, for the NAACP and the communities they serve, the, the, the messaging and their needs were a little different than the Latinx community. Um, very also a little different for our Chuk Pacific Islander uh, communities. Um, very different for um, other segments of community like LTPG. Um, so, so we knew that um, Though the, there were a lot of similarities in terms of the stated needs, we also had to make sure that the messaging was, was in alignment. Um, we, we also vetted the messaging. We looped back with those community stakeholders, those influencers and natural leaders in those communities to check, to vet the messaging, to check for biases, privilege, and, any, and assumptions in every messaging that was specifically for those communities. Um, but I think I think the most important, most overarching thing that we in, in our process is um, we we respected and honored their perspective. Um, we we know that not every community has expertise in public health. However, we recognize that every community um, and culture has expertise um, in how they engage and how they share information. Um, specifically around the topic of, you know, uh, of COVID-19. Um, and um, as we honored their perspective, um, you know, we, we continue to lean on their expertise to help us vet that messaging um, where, 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 where in which language in terms of content was most appropriate. Um, we want to be respectful in terms of how their communities um, receive the messaging as well. Um, so I did really quick, kind of a 30,000 foot level explanation. And I'm hoping I'm under time. You are. Good. Um, so I, um, I thank you, Christine, for allowing me the space and time to share the process that we use in Southwest Washington um, uh, 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 utilizing trauma informed on um, when we engage with a uh, community stakeholder, BIPOC, Latinx community stakeholders um, in the process of creating messaging to mitigate the harms of COVID-19 in our community. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. So committee, um, I'm going to stop sharing for a, just a brief second and to see if anybody has questions for Diana. And, and to thank Diana for stepping forward and for giving that wonderful overview for us. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes. Because now, um, with the help of Abe and Diana, um, uh, we have suggested words for the trauma-informed approach in the charter. So the, the information in pink is the suggested changes to the charter. And you have, have seen this. It's, we gave this to you a week ago as well as again today. So apply new independent and creative thinking grounded in humility and a culture of continuous learning towards equity in tolling to provide equitable outcomes and an equitable engagement process for the I-205, I-5 tool projects. Apply a holistic approach within the transportation system that looks at other social determinants of health, including trauma caused by historic injustices. Foster safety in our conversations by acknowledging and centering the current inequities that exist in the transportation system and the injustices that have been committed against people from historically underrepresented and underserved communities. These. And then use a trauma-informed approach to crafting policy recommendations to prevent harm, to facilitate benefits, and to possibly address past harms. Also in the charter, consider best practices for community engagement to create inclusive, comfortable, and welcoming and safe environments for all and provide resources and strategies that are appropriate for the populations we wish to serve. And then promote and share understanding of social justice, equity, and trauma-informed approaches amongst all partners to support health, affordability, and access to opportunity for Portland Metro and Southwest Washington areas. So these are the proposed changes that um, we have come forward with. And my question to you is with these edits, are we ready to adopt the charter? So I just stopped sharing so we can have a conversation. Kari. Hi, um, I was actually sort of hoping you might go back to sharing so I could refer to the language, but I- I can do that. I can, I can uh, add to the, that. The first slide with the edited language, um, I wanna just start by saying thank you for all of this work um, and for the explanation, Diana. It was great to hear that perspective and, and how this all comes together and how you've done this work successfully as I know in Southwest Washington, so that's- it's really helpful. Um, I overall support um, this approach and these edits. Um, what I wanted to say was the last bullet specifically, um, I think that just the language around, I like the bullet, the, I like this point. Um, I have a slight concern around possibly addressing past harms. Um, that just feels like it's sort of opening the door to there being an out um, around uh, intentionally trying to address past harms. And I think that we've heard um, many times in this committee and from others, and I've, I know I've heard from folks in the community um, <clears throat> that we're, we're really, you know, wanting to grapple with um, not only what is happening today on the system, and what might happen because of the implementation of tolls, but also what is happening today and historically because of the construction of this way um, to folks who uh, you know can't even. So, 
system Ari, more than it's placed for others. You would want stronger language. I just I I think the possibly just feels. Oh, yeah, maybe it's it's not strong enough. Um, it it just it feels like an out, um, like it, it's already giving an out. Um, I, I think that m my perspective is that, and I feel like what I've heard from others is that we do want to look at how we address past harms, and that's not saying that we are going to address all past harms. But I feel like um, some you know, something in there um, considering how we address past harms or something like that would be. Um, Beautiful. Thank yeah. you for that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Amanda. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate the trauma-informed language. I, I think that looks great. My, um, my only comment, and I apologize, I didn't, uh, I wasn't at the last meeting and so maybe this was discussed, but I just noticed in the vision on the very first page, it just says Portland. It doesn't say Portland Metro. And I am, um, I don't know if there's discussion about that, but because I represent Washington County, I would prefer to say Portland Metro. Okay. Beautiful. Wonderful. Um, I, so noted and will be updated. If people, I want to see kind of a thumbs up around that. Yes, does that feel good? Yep, I see thumbs up. Thank you. So um, we can come back to you with revisions to that last that last sentence on the first page, and you know, around possibly, and um, adopt the charter with that revision and with the revision on the first page that says Portland Metro area. So we will bring that back to you next month. That'll be one of the first things that we do is to adopt the charter. Can I see thumbs up from everyone that says, yes, that's our way to go? Yeah, I'm seeing hands, I'm seeing thumbs. Very good. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. And I just so appreciate um, our ability to be able to make decisions and to move forward. So this is hey, fantastic. Yes, yes. Sorry, can you go back to that last slide again? Mm hmm. So um, as you, as the staff look through the different, oh, I'm sorry, the, I just have another suggestion on the last bullet around trauma-informed care. Okay. And, and um, I appreciate her for bringing this up because when I first read it, I was like, this is great language, but she's right. I mean that, but I, I would also wonder if instead of saying um, to facilitate benefits and to possibly, could you say facilitate community benefits? Just to make, and that's just my opinion, but to be a little bit more specific where those benefits would be focused. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Be glad to make that addition. Wonderful. Again, thank you, everyone. Uh, and I appreciate you jumping in and saying, go back and we need to have a conversation. So kudos, kudos, kudos. So part of this work is then going to be transferred into the equity framework. And I want to be able to have a deeper conversation around that in September. So we're going to hold for now. We will update language in the framework and bring that back to you in September for a conversation. So I just want you to know that it's on the docket, but we're going to have to keep moving forward through our wonderful 2020 committee work plan that we have. And as you can see, we're using step one in our framework, which is to identify who, what, and where could be impacted by the I-205 toll project. In September, step two, define equity outcomes and performance measures and how this project intersects with the environmental review process with the NEPA 
process. So we'll be learning about that. Then we have time in October to define those equity outcomes and performance measures again. We we'll continue looking at that. Um, in November, determine benefits and burdens and discuss potential impacts. In December, it's just a big um, information processing meeting with the regional modeling group and the transit multimodal working group. I think we need to hear from both of those groups that are and the work that they're doing. And then in January, choose options that advance equity. So this again is kind of our roadmap or where we're going and what we're trying to accomplish over the next six months. Um, I am, we're right on time. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing and let us hear a little bit if people agree with this, if there's any concerns with this, um, if we can all buy into this. <laughs> Any thoughts? Okay, we're in a good place. We're going. I do have. We're going. Um, really. One comment. Is that okay? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm sorry, I didn't see you, Michael. Yes. No, that's a, that's okay. I didn't get to that um, hand raising button fast enough. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I I just wanted to to check in. I. I know we're working through this um, this framework, and I'm really excited to do that. Um, but in today's agenda, are we also kind of diving into some decision points that are happening on the tolling on I-205? Um, in what sense? Like today's is a lot of information in order for you to be able to say, um, "Here's the uh, here are are the." Um, populations that could be uh, affected, right? And so we're, we're in that step one in terms of identifying the who, what, where. Um, that's what our purpose is for today. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yep, yep. thank you. Good. Any other questions, thoughts? Abe? Yeah, I guess it's just a, maybe we're still too early in our meetings for, the, for this question, um, but I was curious and thinking about timeline, how our framework aligns with the NEPA process and how those two things interact and intertwine and how the, the timing of our framework steps will feed into that NEPA process and, and vice versa. Um, so it sounds like we'll be talking more about that in our next meeting, but it would be helpful to get more clarity around the two tandem processes, either today or in the future. Exactly. No, and and Josh, who is up, coming up pretty soon, is the person to ask. And he, and, and yes, next month is all about NEPA and the crosswalking between the, the framework as well as that what's in that process too. So. You're right, you're spot on. Yes, I can't do it all at once. <laughs> I want to, but I can't. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna share my screen again and we're gonna keep going. Um, so again, I just want to us to review, here's our framework. We're in step one, identify who, what, where, and uh, where, baseline, of historic current injustices, the communities that use I-205, communities affected by rerouting of I-205, and factors area that affect mobility. So that's what we're going to be examining today. So how did we get here? I would love to introduce Travis Brower, the Assistant Director at Oregon Department of Transportation's Department of Revenue and Finance and Compliance. Travis, you are up. Is Travis on board? Penny. He's being promoted even as we speak. Awesome. 
least that's what I hear from Brett. <laughs> Let's see here. Travis is a panelist, but I'm not able to hear you, Travis. Um, can you check your microphone for us? Christine. Still can't hear you, Travis. Christine, yes. I will go. He's in this building, yes. so I'll let him use my computer. Hold on. Wait, Travis. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. There you go. Your audio is connected. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. I was on the phone and for some reason it wouldn't unmute, but then uh, I just switched over to the computer. So my uh, apologies if the audio is a little bit choppy, uh, given that I am uh, running it through the computer uh, rather than the, the better landline I had uh, lined up. So hey, welcome aboard. <laughs> What was the fun of uh, Zoom meetings and all those other connections? So uh, I am going to talk to you through a little bit about how we got here uh, and also a little bit about some of the constraints uh, and opportunities for use of toll revenue uh, that may play into the committee's work uh, as we move forward. So uh, I will probably uh, talk through this, but stop in a couple of places and, and let you ask questions and, and throw things at me because uh, I want to be able to, to answer whatever questions you may have. So the tolling work that we at ODOT are undergoing uh, flows directly out of HB 2017. It's the major transportation investment package and, and policy bill that the Oregon legislature passed in 2017 that we call Keep Oregon Moving. It is the largest investment that's ever been made in Oregon's transportation system. Uh, providing over half a billion dollars annually at full implementation for uh, all modes of transportation, whether we're talking about roads uh, or transit or bicycling or pedestrian activities. Uh, so really substantial impact on the transportation system. As the uh, legislature was working through this bill, uh, really from the beginning, they were trying to address the growing congestion that they saw uh, beginning to afflict the Portland metro region. Uh, when they did a series of town halls all across the state in 2016, in the lead up to this legislation, they heard not just in Portland, uh, but also in Medford, in Tillamook, in Eastern Oregon, that uh, congestion in the Portland metro region was starting to have an impact, uh, obviously on the quality of life of people living in the metro region, but also on the economy of the whole state uh, because people, uh, businesses across the state uh, had concerns about their ability to get goods from farms and forests and factories to markets across the world due to the growing congestion in the Portland metro region. So one of the things that the legislature did was really focus on how to address congestion. And they did that from the standpoint of uh, really a sort of an all of the above strategy. Uh, what we would call a comprehensive congestion management strategy for the metro region. That included uh, investments in some uh, highway projects, uh, including uh, the Rose Quarter project, as well as auxiliary lanes on Oregon 217. Uh, but they also made significant investments in transportation, in uh, public transportation, over $100 million a year in annual funding for public transportation operations uh, and capital investments, uh, about 40% of that money goes to TriMet uh, and the other metro uh, area uh, providers uh, for them to ramp up service. Bicycle and pedestrian investments across the, the region, including uh, Safe Routes to School uh, dedicated funding. Uh, and then also uh, as part of that, uh, the, uh, the legislature directed the Transportation Commission to explore tolling on I-5 and I-205 between the Columbia River and the junction of I-205 and I-5 at the southern end of the metro region as a way both to manage demand on the transportation system as well as to raise revenue for investments uh, in the transportation system. So uh, within that legislation, there was both that direction as well as direction to the Transportation Commission as they were undergoing this work to create a congestion relief fund where that toll revenue would go 
uh, and then invest that toll revenue uh, in the transportation system in projects and programs that would help relieve congestion. So uh, generally the legislature gave the Transportation Commission fairly broad authority uh, to determine where to toll, uh, what the toll rates may be, what the tolling uh, general approach would be, uh, and uh, also exactly how to spend that revenue uh, within the confines of the state law and the Oregon constitutional restriction. So the commission has a lot of authority. So it's really good that we have uh, Commissioner Smith uh, now leading this committee uh, and being able to serve uh, that role of bringing back uh, the work of this group to the Transportation Commission as they uh, deliberate on some of the key aspects of this work. So next slide, please. One of the uh, key questions uh, that is needs to be addressed is uh, how that money should be spent, uh, how the revenue that comes from the, the tolls should be allocated uh, to projects across the, the region. So at the commission's meeting about two weeks ago, uh, the toll program through Ms. Broussard uh, made the request that the commission specify that toll revenues uh, collected on a toll corridor be used within that corridor area. Uh, note that we weren't particularly specific about what we meant by corridor, uh, but this came from a standpoint of uh, consistency with some federal requirements uh, that limit the ability to toll and also on some of the ability to use that. Uh, it's also uh, likely to be used as we look uh, with tolling as a financing mechanism uh, that any bonding we do would require the tolling be dedicated within a corridor. Uh, and there were some other reasons as well. And Lucinda can, can cover any of that as necessary uh, as the committee wants to, to, to dive into that. Uh, certainly we've seen that as we've done some public opinion research, uh, the public supports tolling uh, to a greater degree when they see that the, the money that they pay on a corridor is reinvested in improvements to that corridor so they can see a better trip, a, a more reliable trip, uh, less congestion coming out of uh, the toll revenue that they pay. So when we brought that to the commission for a discussion a couple of weeks ago, uh, Commissioner Julie Brown asked for input uh, from the committee. And so that's uh, where we're coming back to this, this group today. Next slide, please. One of the other really important uh, components about the uh, use of toll revenues comes from not just the statute that the legislature passed in 2017, but around the Oregon Constitution. Uh, Article 9, Section 3A, which was uh, included by the, uh, in the Constitution by a vote of the people, is what we call the, the highway fund constitutional restriction. What it says uh, is that uh, any tax basically levied on the ownership, operation, or use of a motor vehicle has to be used exclusively for what we colloquially call highway purposes, but it more directly states the construction, reconstruction, improvement, repair, maintenance, operation, and use of public highways, roads, streets, and roadside rest areas. So that's a, a, a quite a mouthful. And it's important to note that there are really two components of that. One is what goes into the state highway fund. So what is restricted by this constitutional restriction? The second element is how it can be used. So uh, let me talk about both, how, both of those elements, the what goes in and what, how that money can be used uh, and how it applies to toll revenue. So we've had a number of conversations with the Oregon Department of Justice as we look at uh, how we can use the revenues in the state highway fund. And they have looked at both the, the explicit language of the constitutional uh, provision, as well as some case law that has come out of a number of cases. And we believe after that consultation that uh, it is pretty clear that a toll does qualify as a tax on the ownership, operation, or use of a motor vehicle. So in that sense, uh, it's pretty clear based on the case law and some direct language uh, from the Oregon Supreme Court that a toll would be subject to this clause in the constitutional restriction. 
So then the second question is, okay, so if that money from tolls has to be applied uh, to those highway purposes, what does that mean? Uh, and that's where it's important to note that uh, when we talk about highway purposes, it is a little bit broader than just pure road work. So in, in these conversations with the Department of Justice and as they've looked at the case law, there are a number of areas where obviously uh, we have to invest uh, highway money in highways, but that can be broadly construed. And so we think that there are some opportunities to make investments in what may be considered non-highway uh, purposes as well. So that would uh, include things such as dedicated lanes for transit or carpooling, shared lanes uh, where uh, autos and light rail uh, traffic could mix, uh, queue jumping lanes where buses and, and transit vehicles uh, could make sure that they had priority uh, to get around traffic, particularly at, at uh, uh, traffic signals. That also could include transit facilities within public highway rights of way, such as transit stops and transit stations, as well as park and ride locations that are in or adjacent to the right of way that serves buses, uh, as well as transit signal priority, highway pullouts to accommodate buses. And then uh, broadly speaking, we have the ability to use highway funds for bicycle and pedestrian facilities within the highway uh, right of way. So that gives you a sense of the opportunities we have when it comes to these toll revenues, where that money can be spent. Now, I'd also note, obviously, that uh, as we look at ways to uh, mitigate uh, and address both the impact of tolls and the historical injustices and, and current injustices uh, that are inherent in the investment in the transportation system, uh, there are other sources of funding within ODOT's budget uh, that in some cases could be brought to bear to address some of those issues. So we're talking specifically here about toll revenue. There are some other revenue sources that are not dedicated by the highway constitutional restriction that also are potentially available uh, for mitigation work. Uh, so I will stop there uh, and be happy to answer any questions about some of this. Uh, or take your comments and uh, be able to come back uh, with any additional information that may be necessary. We have like two or three minutes to be able to ask you questions. Thank you so much for that, Travis. Really appreciate that um, grounding for our work. I really do appreciate that. I do have a question because I wanna know what that right away is. Mm -hmm. Is it like two miles on each side or is it, six or uh, you know i just yeah. a super quick question that we'll go to kari and then michael uh christine good question and generally the right of way is the publicly owned strip of land uh within which the road uh, operates so i will tell you that uh say on i-205 uh on the northern portion of the corridor uh we have built the i-205 multi-use path within that highway right of way and also, I believe that uh, in some cases, the, uh, the light rail operates within the light of right of way, although in some cases, we may have actually sold that uh, to TriMet. So I can't say for certain that that is the case. Uh, so the right of way is a little bit narrower there, and we do have some restrictions. Now, I'll tell you also that we have the ability to use federal highway funds, not state highway funds, on bicycle and pedestrian and transit infrastructure outside of the right of way when we are, are looking at more expansive investments. Thank you so much for that. Kari? Thank you. Thanks, Travis, for the presentation. That was informative. Um, I had two questions. The first one is um, in the definition, what the term operation specifically means um, around being able to spend this funding. And the second question is, my understanding is that in the past, um, there's been highway trust funds used for mitigation of, you know, highway stuff, um, like building sound walls and things like that. Is that accurate? Um, that, that things such as a sound wall to mitigate the impact have been used in the past, and that might be something that we consider when we think about mitigation. Yeah, they, good questions. Um, 
so if you're talking about the operation in that second clause around the highway purposes, uh, it's funny, I asked that question to DOJ as well, and they said, you know, nobody really knows, actually. Uh, that's one that has not been extensively tested in case law, uh, but generally the uh, direction from the, the Supreme Court has made a narrower uh, interpretation of the use of highway funds uh, than less expansive. So even these areas where we laid out where we think we have the authority to use uh, the state highway fund on some of those bike pad and transit uh, are a little bit untested, but we think that they do fall within the existing case law. Uh, to your second point about mitigation, um, yes, uh, absolutely. We are able to use funds uh, to mitigate the generally the environmental and community impacts uh, within some set of strictures. And I don't know the exact set of strictures. So absolutely noise walls are appropriate. We also are able to use highway funds uh, to meet federal or state environmental permitting requirements. So for example, if we are uh, to impact a wetland, uh, we can use highway funds uh, to do mitigation work by creating uh, wetlands either on site uh, or water quality features, which we have at many of our interchanges now, or in some cases we do mitigation banking where we're able to contribute to quality uh, uh, water features elsewhere off the system. I don't know the exact strictures there. Some of it is governed by the specific permit that we're required to get from the federal government. Thank you for that. Thank you, Kari. Michael, and then Bill, and then we need to move on. Go right ahead, Michael. Thank hey, you, Travis. Travis. Thank you for sharing. I, I guess I wanted to, to dig into, um, you know, when, when we talk about tolling, you know, we, we can expect that some um, drivers will choose to go on other, you know, routes um, to get to different, you know, destinations. And so we, we see an impact really going beyond just the the highway itself or the right of way. And so like within this um, sort of saying money needs to be spent in that corridor, do we have the ability to expand like what that definition of a corridor is? And and particularly, I think some people were, were talking about this point and you mentioned it yourself, but having, um, you know, the option for investments and alternatives like bicycles, walking, investments in transit. Like a lot of times people are walking, biking and taking transit, but not like right alongside a highway, right? And so we're trying to help people move in a way that makes sense. And so do you have any comments on like sort of what a, like a corridor could mean and could that mean something more broader? Yeah, thanks, Michael. That's a really good question. And Michael, I think, uh, I think my daughter may have been in your class at a PSU Summer Transportation Institute. Oh, uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, the, uh, the definition of corridor was left a little bit broad here uh, or, or undefined. And I think that's one of the issues that I, I think we'd like to explore a little bit more. Uh, and I guess I would I'd look to Lucinda if she has anything to add there. But certainly the, the constitutional restriction would not preclude use of uh, toll revenue off of the state highway system uh, as uh, constitutionally dedicated money for highways can be spent on local roads as well. So there's nothing inherent about that. So it could be something that uh, could be an issue that this, this committee uh, weighs in on and that the Transportation Commission makes some decision about uh, what we would call off system by which we mean off the state highway system uh, investments. Thank you. Thank you. I guess one idea I wanted to throw out for consideration is that um, Metro has a mobility corridor atlas and it has done some thinking around like how people move throughout the region. So I wonder if that would be something to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. But yes, I think having you talk about that at one of our committee meetings may be a really good thing. So. I throw that back to you, that possible, possible presentation in your future. Bill. I'm curious how this would affect an organization like CTRAN, which is located in Washington, but provides a high level service in Oregon. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, good question. So uh, we, uh, with 
the restriction on the use of highway funds could make investments uh, in the highway system that would facilitate uh, CTRAN operations. Uh, you know, for example, we've explored uh, bus on shoulder investments uh, that would make sure that transit was able to move more seamlessly along congested corridors uh, or other, you know, transit stops for, for CTRAN uh, uh, or any, you know, other transit providers, whether it's uh, SMART or TriMet, CTRAN, any of those would be eligible. I think we have some ability to use the state highway fund outside of uh, the state of Oregon uh, in limited cases uh, that may require some statutory direction, as I believe we were looking at that for the Interstate 5 bridge, for example. Thank you. It would be nice to know more about that last part you just mentioned, but that can be a future meeting, obviously. Absolutely. I think we're going to have Travis back maybe a couple of times. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for your expertise and for your presentation and to definitely invite you back. So thank you so much, Travis. Yep, I'd be happy really to come back anytime. It. Thank you. All right, I'm going to share my screen and continue on. So again, here we are taking a deeper dive into step one. And this evening, we are so excited to have Emily Benoit here as our, uh, she's part of the consultant team at WSP, and she's a transportation planner. Emily is going to lead us through a brief history of I-205 and how it was created. So Emily, I'm going to ask you to tell me when to advance the slides. Thanks, Christine. Uh, can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Thank Great. you. Great. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, as Christine said, I'm Emily Benoit. I'll be sharing with you a little bit about the history of planning and implementation on I-205. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so first, I wanted to provide a little bit of regional context. So who was in this area when I-205 was built? First, the area where I-205 was originally proposed was part of Multnomah County. The city of Portland didn't extend as far east as it does today. Second, this part of the region was more rural than it is today. And third, the area was predominantly white before I-205 was built. So this leads us to who wasn't here and why weren't they here? Many native people were not on this land because of tribal treaties and promises that were broken to them over the years. Communities of color were not on this land because of exclusionary laws that prohibited them from living or buying land in this part of the region. Communities of color and persons experiencing low income uh, are not mentioned in a lot of the research around the planning of I-205, which differs from research in other areas such as on I-5. However, today I'm only gonna be focusing on I-205 and not the region as a whole. Next slide, please. So here's a brief overview of the history of I-205. You'll see some links to the who and why that were discussed uh, on a previous slide and previous slides today. So our story for today begins in 1955 and ends in 1982. Initially, a north-south highway on the east side of Portland was proposed in the 1955 Freeway and Expressway System Report by the Oregon Highway Department. This built on a 1943 highway plan for the, for the Portland region from Robert Moses, the infamous highway engineer from New York City. Several different highway route options and connections throughout Portland were proposed in these reports, mostly in areas where street networks were already fully developed. Next slide, please. I-205 was originally proposed with two possible routes in Eastern Multnomah County, connecting to Vancouver to the north across the Columbia River. The figure on the right shows these two routes with the Columbia River located between numbers eight and 15 towards the top, with I-84 below numbers six and 14 in the middle, and with West Lynn and Oregon City located by numbers three and 11 respectively near the bottom of the image. One route was along 52nd Ave, the inner route, and the other at 96th Ave, the outer route, through what is now East Portland. In 1961, the outer alignment traveling south at 96th Ave was selected which is the route on the right of the image. The southern end was not yet determined, 
but it was intended to eventually connect to I-5. And at this point, all the southern alignments at some point went through Lake Oswego. Also, I-205 was intended to connect to the Mount Hood Freeway, which was proposed between Division Street and Powell Boulevard in Southeast Portland. Next slide, please. Once the alignment was selected for I-205, residents in the neighborhoods that would be along the route and affected by the new highway started to voice their opinions to the alignment. Specifically, public opposition to the exact alignment came from adjacent jurisdictions and neighborhood groups who did not want the highway to go through their communities. The most famous of, the op of these oppositions was the fight around the Mount Hood Freeway, once at the southern section of I-205, which was eventually canceled. The figure on the right from the Oregonian in 1965 displays what's called the gopher problem, where some stakeholders pop up in the field at different points in time to challenge or halt or push forward the highway project. While this cartoon only shows a few stakeholders, others involved in this process for the I-205 project include the OTC, ODOT, and neighborhood groups from Laurelhurst, Park Rose, and other neighborhoods on the east side. Uh, there are two notable examples of community opposition around I-205. The first is Lake Oswego, who by 1963 was able to influence a more southern route alignment of I-205 between West Lynn and Oregon City and not routing through Lake Oswego. The second is Maywood Park, who around 1967 was then still a part of the city of Portland. They became their own incorporated municipality through community organizing against the I-205 alignment, literally changing the map, and eventually influenced the I-205 alignment further west towards Rocky Butte Park for less destruction in their community. Next slide, please. Public opposition continued to delay the final alignment and thus the construction of I-205. The map on this slide with the Columbia River on the left and the city of Portland on the right shows the I-205 alignment along 96th Ave and shows the Southern section with the Mount Hood Freeway turning west just above Powell Boulevard and heading directly towards the Willamette River. Shortly after this image was created, the alignment took a much more Southern route to where it is located today. The first section of the highway from West Lynn to Oregon City, which included the Abernathy Bridge, opened to traffic in 1970. Ultimately, public opposition played a big role in the location of the final alignment and timeline of construction. The process for I-205 planning was significant in that it marked a turning point for public activism, engagement, and organized opposition with highway planning. It was also the first time in the Portland area that major themes of environmental activism and protest were part of the planning process and help shift the importance of people's role in major highway planning projects. Finally, the construction of I-205 was completed in 1982. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Christine. Thank you so much, Emily. That was um, so informative. <laughs> that, that race through history, which had such huge impacts. So thank you so much. Are there any questions for Emily? I think I'll stop share for a super quick moment. See if anybody has any questions. No questions? Okay, well again, thank you, Emily. Really appreciate that presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. All right, so then again. Christine, Sharon's yeah. hand. Yes, yes, yes. Sharon's hand. Um, so Oh, I'm sorry about that. Sharon, go right ahead. That's okay. So just a quick question. Given the opposition and how things ultimately um, developed, it, do you have a sense or a consensus of who, what populations were most negatively impacted by the alignment? Or is that, do we not know that? <laughs> From the research that I've done, I do not know that of who was uh, most impacted. Um, this is mostly um, historical accounts from newspapers and public documents at the time. So a lot of the things that we talk about today weren't necessarily talked about in the same way, as well as the populations that were impacted or weren't impacted. Um, so from the research, I'm not able to answer that. Thank you. Thanks. 
Yes, it's really powerful how the questions that we're asking today are very different than they did in the past. Exactly. So thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. All right, back to sharing again. And again, here we are um, looking at the who, what, and where. And so what's so wonderful about this committee is that we have an incredible depth of expertise. And I am going to introduce Abe Moland now. He is one of our committee members. Uh, he's with Clackamas County Health and Transportation. Uh, he's an impact planner, transportation impact planner. And one way of defining that who, what, and where is through a transportation equity index. So Abe, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you and you just tell me when to click. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm thankful for a chance to talk about this work. Um, we're going to talk about the transportation equity index, which is just one way that we're starting to think about equity in Clackamas as it relates to transportation, because um, there's a whole slew of different lenses and approaches, and this is just, just one of many. Um, so next slide. Um, and the index in particular is a is kind of a place-based, population-based mapping approach. And to start this work, we did a review of transportation and comprehensive plans that have been completed within the county at the county or at the city level um, within the, the past 10 years to look at how they have, um, how those documents and those processes have uh, mapped equity and looked at um, different populations across the county through a, a geospatial lens. And we looked at the variables that were most commonly used in those mapping approaches. And those are what you see listed on the screen there, 65 and older, younger than 18, communities of color, Hispanic, Latinx, American ethnicity, low-income households, people with limited English proficiency, and people with one or more disabilities. And so this also aligns very well with um, our framework and the, the groups that we're concerned about uh, making sure that we're minimizing harm and maximizing benefit for and within our uh, group with the tolling project. And um, I can talk a little bit about the index methodology that we used. We took each of those variables and then um, drilled them down to the census tract level and then found the average for the county and then created an index. Um, I'm kind of boring myself as I talk about this, so bear with me as I, as I move through this. Um, we took that county average and then created a, a score of zero through four. Two was, mean, was meaning that that census tract was um, similar to the county average. And then if it was lower than two, that meant that the, the uh, percentage for that census tract was lower than the county average. And if it was three or higher, that meant that it was higher than the county average. And so we created this similar scoring system for all of those variables and then added them together to create an index. And that gave us a starting point to start to understand when we're thinking about transportation planning projects or land use projects, who are the groups that we need to be thinking about as we plan those projects and as we implement them. Um, and we're testing this out in a couple of different ways. We used an earlier version of this in um, a formula that was looking at prioritizing safety projects um, through the community road fund. And we're using this to think about how we inform outreach and engagement for some upcoming projects. And this is a great opportunity to uh, pilot it in the, um, in the tolling project to understand who, who is um, in some of the areas that we may be um, wanting to uh, spend more focus and attention on. Um, so next slide. So I'm gonna give a, a mini preview here that the yellow, green, light blue, and dark blue have meaning. <laughs> Right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And so this is the end product, the map. Um, and it's really hard to see in some of the small areas. And we'll zoom in in, in the upcoming slides. Um, but that just shows that um, certain areas become quickly more, more apparent um, based on the, the higher number of percentages of groups that we are concerned about. Um, so if we want to click to the next slide. Um, this is in the Gladstone Johnson City area, and there are three dark blue census tracts um, along the 205 corridor that um, have some of the 
highest uh, transportation equity index scores in the county. And some of the variables that are driving those up are there's high percentages of seniors, uh, low income communities, and then people with one or more disability. And then next slide. And then this is the Canby Barlow area along 99. And again, two census tracts that score pretty high on the index um, and some of the variables that um, are pertinent there is there's uh, higher percentages of Latinx communities, um, folks with limited English proficiency, and then low income communities. Um, and then drilling down, an example of how this is used to further explore is once we know that this is an area that we want to be focusing more attention on, just honing in on Google Maps and doing a kind of a street view perspective to understand some of the existing conditions. And there's a um, senior uh, manufactured facility, uh, senior living manufactured homes facility around there, the mobile home park. Um, and so just wanting to be uh, cognizant of the folks that live there as we may start seeing more diversion uh, traffic moving through that, that area as we're really the total modeling. Next slide. Oh, sorry, next slide. And then uh, finally, this is That's essentially right, a preview of what, what, what is to come when we start talking about performance metrics. This is something that we're also working with our epidemiologist within the county to start pulling some health related performance metrics um, to look at this through a health equity angle. And so these are some of the more common transportation related health outcome areas, uh, looking at respiratory health with asthma, and asthma related emergency room uh, admissions, cardiovascular health, um, mental health, physical health, travel safety, and then cancer. And so as we start to pull this data and dig into a little bit more, we're gonna be parsing by race age and ethnicity when able um, to start to provide some benchmarks and understanding uh, some of the more vulnerable groups as it relates to health um, in relation to diversion traffic and the, the tolling project. Any questions, comments, thoughts? I don't know if we have time to take those. I'll take a couple, yep. Hey, Phil. Yeah, uh, Abe, uh, I, I, I really like that uh, that summary. And I, I just have, um, uh, well, I guess, I guess I have two questions. One is, um, how, how, how would we take into account uh, people who are homeless um, as a, as, oh, and should we uh, take that into account I mean, as a, a, a category, you know, along with all the other categories that you've listed? Because I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, there may not be quite the same geographic boundaries that, uh, that those who are homeless would fit into, but I just wonder how we account for that as a, as a obviously increasing group. Uh, number two, on the, on the health-related outcomes, um, I would also imagine that a, a, a transportation-related health outcome would be the ability of uh, people to be able to access uh, important services. So their ability to get to medical care, their ability to you know, get to certain social services. Um, I mean, that would, I think, very uh, legitimately be considered um, a health issue. Uh, especially as it plays into, you know, social health, um, you know, social cohesion uh, and other kinds of elements that may not have been traditionally a part of, quote, physical or disease related health outcomes. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about 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 that. Yeah, um, the, the houseless question that definitely is, is not captured in the, the equity index, which yeah. is why I want to emphasize how much of a starting point for conversation yeah. really is. Um, and uh, I think the, the homeless point in time count that happens every year is potentially a source for us to um, look at trends um, in the county and the region. Um, and then there's been a lot of, lot of other group work focused on, on mm -hmm. houselessness to tie in any of their, their initiatives. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I have a great answer that yeah. um, well, I don't know I don't know what the answer yeah. to that is I yeah. just pose that as a, as a provocative uh, uh, provocative question yeah 
Yeah, and then definitely on the access to to healthcare opportunities, I think that's a it's a big big uh, big system and an important piece of the conversation too. And it, I think it fits into under the kind of the access to opportunity yeah. um, element of our performance framework. Um, Which we're moving into now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I sort of, I sort of saw that coming, but thought I would mention it here anyway. <laughs> You're just teeing it up. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your questions, Abe. Thank you for this presentation. I'm sure we're going to be coming back to you again throughout the process, and you know, it, this is an iterative process, right, of identifying all of the, going through the five steps, and then again, did we get every person? Did we get every community that we really want to focus on? So we'll be coming back through again, and I, and I deeply appreciate your uh, giving of your time to bring this to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So, then corridor usage is our next stop with Josh Channel, who's a, on the consultant team with WSP. Um, and he's a transportation planner also, who's going to lead us through the um, toll project in I-205. I and uh, he, he is actually leading the I-5 corridor work at the moment. Josh, I'm going to tee you up and ask right. you to step in. Can you hear Thank me all you. right? And, uh, and John, sure John, before, before we go there, Christine, can you make another note that uh, we have a couple of uh, observers with their hands up that- uh, Oh, yes. I'm so sorry that we're unable to take your comments and take your questions. And then again, I invite you pretty please to um, give us your comments and questions at, our, at, our, at the website. So. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. <laughs> Appreciate that. Josh? All right. The floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Christine, and thanks, Abe. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm a transportation planner on the consultant team. I have a, a particular fascination with tolling and congestion pricing. Um, so when we can get back to parties, I'm, I'm great for conversation starters. Um, really fascinating stuff. Uh, I work for WSP. Um, uh, it's a large firm but I also have a large team that I work with of small firms that are helping us really understand and think through with you all um, how we can successfully roll out tolling in the region. So I, I wanna kind of give props to the, the really large team of folks that are behind this, um, uh, firms of all, of all small sizes. Um, for the purposes of this committee, uh, I have the amazing good fortune of getting to work with Christine, Lucinda and Hannah on a daily basis. Um, I'm kind of the primary liaison between Christine, the committee, and the technical team. Um, so you will probably see some more of me. Uh, I'm going to fly through a lot of information today, but I'm very available to this committee in the future. So um, bear with me. Uh, next slide, Christine. Yes, and I'm going to invite people to take notes as they go as you go through these. Thanks, Josh. All right. So Abe gave us a good overview of some of the less advantaged areas around the I-205 corridor. We have a lot more data we can share. And at the end of the meeting, I'm gonna ask how you want this information, what you need, what format. Um, we really wanna make sure that we're providing you the right level of information. We're not burying you and we're not over summarizing. So that's important. Um, so uh, for framework step one, Abe showed us some residential data and I wanna start digging into some more of the other factors, starting with who uses the bridge. Um, so this map shows the daily number of users on the Abernathy Bridge, and basically the larger green circles mean more users. This is based on origin destination data that we get out of the Metro Regional Travel Demand Model. Um, ODOT partners with Metro to use the model to study the implications of tolling. And uh, Dora is going to present later, and she's going to talk a little bit more about the model. I, I, I know that there was a question before um, about it. so. Um, for this map, not surprisingly, the highest number of trips over the bridge are from vehicles um, that start their trip near the bridge. Um, so next slide, please. So this map is a little harder to see. Um, and I seem to have lost a table on the right side, but that's OK. Um, uh, it, oh, there it is. Um, 
it shows the percentage of trips from the different origin de and destination zone. So it's, it's a similar look to the circles before, uh, but this is getting into the numbers a little bit more. Um, and I'll just point out right away some things in this that surprised us when we started to look at it. There's a relatively small number of trips that are coming or going from Southwest Washington or from further south along I-205. Uh, for Southwest Washington, it's about 2% of the overall trips that cross through. Um, when we looked at it in more detail, it's a relatively small number of through trips through this section of I-205. Um, but if we add up all the zones immediately around the corridor, uh, where we see those dark green shapes, um, over 40% of the trips in the area start their trip near the Abernathy Bridge. So this is very much a locally used corridor, right? Um, with a, a much smaller uh, number of through trips. So let's uh, go to the next slide. Um, so we have done a little bit of preliminary demographic uh, analysis on who's actually using the bridge. This data is from a company called Streetlights. They're part of the, the new uh, universe of big data firms. They work with cities and universities around the country. And this uses cell phone data and algorithms to kind of develop these numbers. Um, they say they control and adjust for users that don't have access to, to smartphones. Um, and I, I will say with a big data set like this, the data is consistent with what we see for other surveys and studies and ODOT research for who's using the corridor. Um, but it is a private company and we can't completely look under the hood for how they're adjusting. So I just want to put a couple conditions on that. Um, this data doesn't particularly surprise us. People traveling over the Abernethy Bridge, um, it could be drivers or passengers, are a little more likely to be white than the makeup of the region as a whole. Let's go to the next slide, Christine. Um, they're also a little more likely to be wealthier. Um, so not, not surprising given the region. And if we can go to the next slide. So um, we're gonna dig a little bit more into the demographics of the region, building a little bit on what Abe showed us earlier. Abe, Abe's methodology compiles groups, which is fantastic. Um, it gives us a, a really complete picture that is often missing. Um, and we have a tremendous amount of data that we can share, including for um, individual mapping for any of the folks that are showing up in the WHO category here, um, in the WHO column, excuse me. Um, and as part of our work on the consultant team, we're diving deep into this data and looking for potential disproportionate effects. And we're largely using the WHERE column to tell us where there might be disproportional effects to the groups in the WHO column. Um, so, uh, Christine, next slide. So we are not going to go through all of these today. It's far too much information. So take, take, a, take a deep breath, I promise. I'm not going through all of it. Um, but I'm going to use one example, uh, which is uh, people experiencing disability. Um, this information comes from the American Community Survey, which is part of the U.S. Census Department. Um, those with a public health background probably know that the census defines disability fair, fairly narrowly. Um, and it, it might undercount or probably undercounts, um, but this is the best data that we, we have available. Um, so next slide, Christine. So in the area directly around the I-205 corridor, about 12% of the population experiences a disability. That's pretty consistent with national and regional numbers. Um, and the largest percentage are ambulatory dis disabilities. And uh, let's go to the next one. Okay, you'll excuse the color scheme here. Um, this is not, not our, our development, but um, so when we look at this map, the red dot is the Abernathy Bridge and the two lightest colors, colors on this figure, which are the beige and the light blue, show the highest number of people reporting a disability. That's a larger concentration. Um, so it, the, the cities aren't labeled on this map, but the, the highest proportion, uh, higher proportions exist in, in basically all the communities around the bridge. West Lynn, Gladstone, and Oregon City. Um, and as we look further south on this, uh, the big beige shape um, towards the, the southern end um, is that area Abe pointed out before uh, with um, Canby in there. So that's very consistent with what he showed. Um, so uh, next slide, Christine. Okay, so that was just a very, very high level overview. And thinking back to Abe's maps and these, 
we're trying in a short time to give you a kind of a geographic grounding in the who and the where for framework step one. It, it's not the full picture yet, but it, it's a start for the ground. Um, and so as we start to look at equitable mobility, we can go to the next slide, Christine. Thank you. Okay, so that example of people reporting a disability is especially important when we look at other mobility options. And we're just gonna focus on sidewalks right now. On this figure, green lines mean that there's sidewalks on both sides. Yellow lines mean that there's only sidewalks on one side. And if there's not a line, there's no sidewalk at all. So um, some areas have a pretty complete network. Downtown Oregon City and Gladstone um, have a pretty complete network. When you get across the river to West Lynn, um, it's, it's pretty tough to walk or roll across the arch bridge and connect to somewhere in West Lynn um, if, you're, uh, if you're walking or rolling. Um, and then further west, there's no sidewalks available at all. Um, and we have similar maps available for bicycle facilities. Um, so this is one picture of um, mobility options. Let's, uh, let's look at transit next on the next slide, Christine. So a, a pretty similar yeah. picture here. Um, there's a number of transit options to and through Oregon City and Gladstone, and only a few in Westland. Next slide, Christine. Okay, when we look at frequency, um, the number of buses that pass on a route per hour per day, um, we see that there's really only one high capacity frequency line in the region. That's the 33 McLaughlin that goes into downtown. And one more, Christine. Okay. And then when we start to look, these are the same lines. Um, when we when we start to look at the headways or the, the time between vehicles, what could be a 20 minute car trip or even a 15 minute car trip, um, could be an hour wait for a bus on some of these lines. Um, so it, it's uh, challenging um, to look at, to consider alternatives to the automobile in some of these places. Um, and next slide, Christine. This. So uh, Michael mentioned this earlier. This is from Metro's Atlas of Mobility Corridors, which is a fantastic um, collection of maps and documents. Um, and this shows transit accessibility how long it would actually take to get to one of those transit lines. Um, and uh, there's a lot of white space on the map where, where it's not even mapped because it's too far. It's too far to be reasonable to get to one of these transit lines. Um, I'm gonna pause here, just summarize that not to say that non-auto mobility is pretty challenging in this region. Um, I don't wanna in any way minimize the collaboration between all the agencies that is ongoing in this in this area. A lot of hard work has gone into the transit that does exist. Um, there's planned service expansions. There's a strategic scenario about um, what would what else would we expand in the area if we had the money. Um, so there's a lot of thought that goes into this. It increases in route frequency, additional transit lines. Um, so we are working with our transit multimodal working group. Uh, to take a look at how, how can some of these improvements work with, with a tolling scenario. Um, and we will certainly come back to this group and discuss uh, transit many times throughout the course of our work. So I'm gonna um, stop sharing and Josh, um, do you mind taking a couple of questions? Happy to. If we have any. Amanda, and then Bill, and then, and then Kari, and then Michael. <laughs> and that's, that's our limit. Go ahead. Am Amanda, I believe. I don't have my hand up. I don't have a question. Okay. So this isn't so much a question for Josh, but one of the things I've noticed is that we don't have um, adequate representation within this group of people with disabilities. 
Um, so far, to my knowledge, Izzy and I are the only two people who um, advocate for those populations, yet we don't share those same lived experiences. So it would be nice to see some inclusion of folks who have those lived experiences so we can gain from their knowledge of how they um, move around within the metro area and their level of mobility and how it impacts their life. I think that's a great idea, Bill. Um, I'm gonna open this up for just a second. Okay, Michael and, and Kari, hold, the, hold your thoughts there, hold your questions. And I'm gonna ask the committee, um, would you want representation? Do you want us to go back out and to um, recruit specifically, or, uh, um, to be able to have this knowledge and wisdom on the committee? Can I see a thumbs up for that? Yes, I'm seeing many thumbs up. So uh, what I'm gonna do, let's call an audible. <laughs> Hi Park, is that a thumbs up or a question? It's a thumbs up. <laughs> um, Bill and Izzy, I would, um, I, 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 I would like you to be able to um, recruit and then take us take us through an interview process, right? Because all I, I think all of you had to go through an interview process and and invite a person to be able to be on this committee. I think that would be very powerful. That sounds good to me. It seems like it would be equitable to at least have two folks, um, one from maybe Oregon and one from Washington. I'm thinking getting across the Columbia River could be a big challenge to folks, and so they might have a very unique perspective. I Yes, thumbs up. Park, I think you have a question. Ready? Nope, oh. nope, you're agreeing. All right, thumbs up, pretty please. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to add, I, I ran programs for elderly and disabled at TriMet and King County in Seattle for 30 years. So um, my purpose wasn't to represent elderly and disabled, but I worked with them for many years. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Um, all right, we will come back to you with a process. Thank you for that. Kari and Michael, and then we're gonna go to Dora. Thank you. Quick question. Um, thanks Josh for the presentation and, um, and also Abe, hey, those were really great um, just to sort of, yeah, as you say, like understand a little bit more about what's going on there. Um, I had a couple questions for you, Josh. Um, the first one was, and I think it's relevant to what um, Bill just brought up, and I totally support um, a, a more direct voice from the disability community, but I'm curious why you only looked at a one and a half mile radius for people with disabilities um, when the rest of the analysis is really, you know, going as far as um, really regional and, and into Southwest Washington as well. Um, and then my second question, I was curious, you, you sort of answered a little bit about the streetlight data. I was wondering where that data came from. Um, and my question was really around how they control for people who don't have a smartphone um, and aren't being tracked. But uh, more specifically, I'm interested to know, is the streetlight data tracking people in cars only, or is it tracking anyone with a phone who may be moving about in that corridor, say, who might be riding a bike or walking even, or using transit? Thanks. Yeah. Um... So let me start with uh, the first question, which is uh, about the one and a half mile corridor. And that was really based on screening to, to that was initial work to figure out what sort of outreach we need to do and, and how we need to focus our, our efforts um, across the region. As we are looking uh, much more deeply and in, particularly into the rerouting patterns that Dora is gonna get into next um, and seeing other impacted areas and communities, uh, we brought up, um, they brought up Canby before, and I kind of touched on that before. Uh, that's not on the I-205 corridor, but it's definitely an area that we need to 
um, look deeply at, um, and we'll uh, get into that more. Um, but the um, so I, I guess what I'll say is it's it's based on on a screening level, and we are working with um, ODOT and with FHWA to figure out sort of what that what that uh, area looks like that we want to that we want to study for this. What and to do that, we need to dig a little bit into what the what the what we think the effects will be. So we're kind of at that iterative phase right now. Does that help? And then uh, streetlight data, Josh. I'm definitely going to have to get back to you on that one. I am I am not a uh, specialist in in uh, modeling. Um, I know that we we evaluated a few different systems and determined that we felt like streetlight gave us the most accurate information. Um, and uh, uh, you know, it's actually something Dora might be able to speak to. I know she was involved in that. Um, so. Um, but yeah, we'll have to get back to you. I, I understand that it's controlled for non-smartphone users, um, but it is a private company and I don't have a tremendous uh, ability to look under what they're doing, but we'll, we'll get you what information they provide. Thank you so much for those great questions. Michael. Hi, hey Josh, thanks for that wealth of information and all of this data, it's super interesting to look at. And thank you, Abe, as well, for all the data you provided. Can you just explain to me a little bit about the toll districts and how those boundaries were put together? Um, a little, and this again might be a question for, for Dora. The, those are, so the Metro model has 2,100 transportation analysis zones, I think. Um, and so we were uh, compiling them into into groupings and there's there's Dora now. Um, it made sense and we kind of ran it through our regional modeling team and, and talked through uh, what what those zones were that made sense. Um, it, it, Dora, I don't know if you have anything you want to add on that. Yes, uh, you are correct. The Metro model does have 21 something traffic TAZs, traffic analysis zones, and we did uh, discuss with the modeling team on several versions how we how we define the districts um, as some district as the closer to the bridge, we anticipate there are more users of I-205, so the districts are defined to be like smaller areas. But for regions that further from the I-205 corridor, um, we we look at the, the traffic pattern from the TAZs and we think it, it might be reasonable to include them all together into a bigger district. And Dora, are you, are you uh... I think I remember that you were involved in the selection of streetlight. Are you able to talk at all about the, I, I wasn't, the control for that? I wasn't that much involved uh, with the okay. streetlight data for this project, but I know they do have some of their ways to um, factor their trips. So e they, they have some kind of index they calculate it and then they factor your trips up. So you present the regional trips in, in a better, better uh, magnitude. Yeah, but I'm not entirely sure what kind of data we use for this project because I know they have um, location-based data that's um, using using phone, and then they also have some other GPS-based data that was more related to GPS that's used in vehicles. But I cannot speak for for this this project. Okay, so Kari, we're, we're going to have to get back to you with the data about how they capture uh, on system and off system, um, and and non-smartphone users. So Josh, I'm going to invite you to um, introduce Dora for us, right. if you don't mind. So we're going to launch into her presentation when you're done with the, her introduction. All right. I, I think this is really just a little bit of introduction to some of the work Dora has been doing. Dora is very capable of introducing herself. Um, but um, I do want to say this is based on initial modeling. Uh, that we're looking at the effects of tolls. So uh, we mentioned before we're using the Metro's regional travel demand mark model. Um, ODOT partners with Metro on this and Metro actually does the model runs. Um, and this is preliminary. This is screening level um, and it's based on 2027 modeling. Um, and later in the process, we're gonna look at 2040 as well. James mentioned this before, we know traffic volumes are down because of COVID restrictions. Um, I mean, it, it's just, Four months ago, everyone was still complaining about the traffic, and uh, but things have changed very fast. Um, traffic volumes are down, uh, but actually since March, they've been ramping up again pretty quickly, uh, particularly on a daily basis. Um, and within the, the timeframes of this model, 
2027 and 2040 as the region continues to grow, we do expect traffic volumes will recover. And we, we do think that um, this captures the, the, gives us a good picture of what the potential effects are of tolling. Um, but at this level, we're really looking at patterns or trends and not uh, specifics about uh, an individual location. Um, and this is really, this is a summary. Uh, we have a lot more information on the online open house for I-205. Uh, we're gonna share a link at the end of the meeting. We hope you want more information and you'll go take a look at it. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Dora. Thank you, Josh. Hello everyone, I'm Dora Wu. I'm a travel demand modeler with WSP. So today I'm going to present to you the initial screening results, what we're seeing with modeling of tolls. So for this analysis, as Josh mentioned, we're working with Portland Metro's travel demand model which forecasts travel demand and distributes them to a regional network. As Josh mentioned, this is the first tool we're using. We will be using more tools to perform further analysis. And this, the, the results I'm presenting today are quite preliminary. We have looked into five alternatives for the year 2027. Uh, more information about the five alternatives, like Josh said, can be found on the online open house for the I-205 tolling project. And today we'll be looking at larger chains of what tolling might bring to the regional area and the local area. So we will first look at the changes along I-205 and then look at the changes at the regional level. Then we will look at changes at the local level. Next slide, please. So first we'll look at the changes in I-205 traffic volumes from the preliminary modeling results. Compared to a no-toll scenario where none of the tolls included on any of the I-205 segments for all alter tolling alternatives, we see toll sections of I-205 have lower overall traffic volumes. The daily traffic volume decreased 15 to 35% on toll segments on I-205. We also see different amounts of traffic diverting off I-205 and the diversion is bigger during the off-peak hours than during the peak hours. I will explain more about diver what diversion means in the next slide. Next slide, please. So I, here I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what we mean by diversion and rerouting, which I will mention a few more times more in the upcoming slides. So there are a few types of diversion. It can mean rerouting to other roadways, and it can also mean changing travel behavior, such as change time of travel, change trip destinations, and change of travel modes, such as change, to, um, change between drive along and carpooling, or use transit, use biking. So Rerouting is one type of diversion, but diversion can also mean something other than rerouting. Okay, so in the last slide, we talk about some vehicles will divert off I-205 when it's told. So where does all this traffic go? Some of them will reroute to other roadways, including regional highways and local routes that's near the total area. And some travelers would change their travel behavior. They will change time of day of travel, they will change their trip destinations. And some of the travelers would change to carpool or change to use transit. When we look at regional demand, the preliminary modeling results show there are fewer drive along vehicle trips, there are more share ride trips, and we also observed a small shift to transit and active modes such as biking and walking. Overall, regional wide, we see fewer cars on roads and less time spent driving. Next slide, please. Now we're going to look at the rerouting effects on other highways. It is, it might be logical to assume there will be a big shift to I-5 as more travelers use I-5 to get to Portland. But the model results show the shift to I-5 is relatively minor and under 5%. For the I-5 segments south of the I-5 and I-205 interchange, the model actually show a decrease on some segments. The model also show a minor shift to other freeways on I-84, Oregon 217, and US 26. And similar to the pattern we observe along I-205, the rerouting effects are bigger during off-peak hours than during the peak hours. The peak hour effects are nearly negligible to, on other highways. Next slide, please. For the Portland bridges, all alternatives show a relatively minor shift from Abernathy Bridge to other bridges over Philemon. River. There is a slightly bigger increase in traffic on Selwood Bridge as it is the bridge that's closer to the I-205 corridor that's told. And the diversion effects, the diversion rerouting effects are bigger, are greater during off-peak hours than during the peak hours. 
Next slide, please. Now we have seen that the regional rerouting effects are minor for all alternatives. So where are we seeing the biggest changes? Next, I'm going to um, present to you the, the changing traffic patterns that we see in local communities um, for Canby, Glastone, Oregon City, and Westland. So for this map and the maps that we're going to see in the next few slides, um, the red dots indicate lo locations where we see bigger changes in traffic patterns. And I also want to remind everyone that this map, uh, similar to what this map as Abe has presented earlier that the dark blue areas are areas of concern that they have higher transportation equity index. So in Canby, um, we see, so, so we see traffic increase near downtown Canby as some traffic um, shift from the I-5, I-205 combination to use Oregon 99E to go south and north. Next slide, please. The story in Glassstone is slightly more com complex because in some alternatives, we show more traffic increase than other alternatives. The locations that see bigger changes in traffic are, are along multiple routes in the downtown grid and also at Oregon 99E at Clackamas River. Next slide, please. So in Oregon City, we can see changing traffic, increasing traffic uh, in a few locations in the downtown grid and also on Oregon City Arch Bridge as some vehicles would try to bypass the toll on I-205 by going through Oregon City. Next slide, please. In West Lane, the locations that we see bigger rerouting effects are locations along Willamette Force Drive as some of the vehicles trying to use the Bowen Road and Willamette Force Drive to bypass I-205 because they run parallel to the I-205 corridor. And I will hand it back to Josh. Okay. Um, let me just pause and see if there's some questions for Dora about some of those specific patterns. Any questions? No. Okay. Um, yeah, Thank you so much, Dora. That was yeah. fantastic. That was great, Dora. Thank you so much. Um, we're seeing a lot of local rerouting. I think that's going to be uh, something we hear about a lot. So, um, okay. So this has been kind of a snapshot of what we're looking at so far, uh, but we definitely need help from this committee because um, we can develop this picture with a high level understanding of historically and currently underserved and underrepresented communities. Um, we can look at factors that affect equitable mobility and Dora's uh, given us kind of a walk through of some of the prelim our preliminary understanding of the diversion patterns through communities near I-205. Um, but there's a lot more uh, factors to equity that this committee started dis discussing um, that we need help with. Uh, so we don't necessarily have a great way yet to evaluate things like the effect on businesses or community facilities that are important to these communities. Um, or access to health promoting facilities such as health clinics or open space. Um, we will, as part of the NEPA analysis, be looking at some human health effects, um, air quality and noise effects. Um, and and uh, we'll be doing an analysis of the economic burden of tolls on individuals experiencing low income. Um, so I, I wanna start building this picture of uh, what we have some tools for and what we don't. And we'll keep discussing this in detail um, at the next two meetings when we're discussing performance measures, uh, because we really do need help from this committee to help us develop performance measures that get at these questions of equity. Um, and then uh, we haven't started on step three at all yet, which is tolling is not new. Um, and there are strategies that are in use in other regions to help advance equity. Um, so uh, we will start presenting that probably uh, around the end of the year um, we'll bring to this committee some of the examples from some of the other regions of strategies that are being used um, to see if they're a good fit for this area and if they help us advance on some of those performance measures that we'll be developing. Um, so, but right now we're still in framework step one uh, and we do have a question for you and 
I'll turn it back to Christine to, to ask that one. Yes, and that question is, what information do we need to provide the committee in order to keep moving toward the draft tool project's equity framework step two, which is to define equity outcomes and performance measures? So ultimately, my question to you today is, what format is most useful for you in receiving this type of information in order then to make those performance measures and, and equity outcomes to be able to identify those. That is the question at hand, and I'm gonna stop sharing um, so we can have that conversation. Um, this is Diana. Um, mm -hmm. Just equity outcomes. I think that for me, um, we need to think about um, a, a, a tool that helps guide our decision, informed equity decision in the process um, before we even begin. Okay, thoughts around that? Diana, you have in your in your trauma informed work, you guys have a decision making heuristic, right? A decision making type of, of process you go through. Is that what you're talking about? Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, and and I'm going to um, ha have Kari uh, join me as well because Kari was part of this work. Kari, Kari and I worked um, together on the Healthy Living Collaborative Southwest Washington Policy Committee. And Kari was also part of the work of designing a, a, a uh, just, just, yeah, I always have a hard time with this, decision criteria tool as we vetted um, policy. Um, and so uh, that tool has gone through a couple of, of uh, revisions over the last number of years, but it's a tool that helps us in, uh, think about the impact, feasibility, sustainability, um, as we go through um, uh, deciding which, which policy um, um, or, or process, um, um, you know, um, yeah, as we decide which policy or process in, in our in our in our decision making. Kari, do you want to add anything more to that? Because I know you were part of that work. Um, thank you. Yeah, I have to dig deep into my brain. Um, if I recall correctly, you know, I think we came up with a series of questions uh, that, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were always coming back to and always asking about at every decision point. And, and that really went through a lot of iterations of making sure that we were being inclusive um, and considering the community as a whole and in particular, anyone who may not be at the actual table that we were at at that time. So that was a nice framework. Um, I'd be happy to go back and review that and, and sort of talk with you, Diana, about um, how that might help inform this work. Mm -hmm. um, but I think mm -hmm. that tends to be what I, I also would say. It's like a series of questions that we can ask at each step along the way. Um, and um, I think also being able to like to revisit that at each meeting to be able to understand, you know, this was the, the issue or what we were discussing, we asked these questions and here were the answers and be able to see that sort of in a chart or some some way so that, that everyone can sort of see that in real time and remember that history of decision-making. Mm -hmm. Very good. I, 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 um, I would welcome that at our next meeting. Um, any other thoughts? So Diana, uh, I think we kind of had teed this up to thinking about presenting this in September. So I invite you to, to come together to bring that forward as an example. I think that would be fabulous. 
Yeah, and I'm I'm gonna see if anyone else wants to join me. I'm I'm I'm, I'm looking at my friend Kari if she wants to be part of that framing that those talking points mm -hmm. um, to present in September. What do you think, Kari? Yeah, happy to happy to jump in. Cool, thank you. Christine James had raised his hand, and also yes. Phil. Beautiful, James, and then Phil. Uh, yeah, um, I just want to say thanks to uh, Josh and Dora. I think that was really great information. Um, and the question you asked, I'm not totally clear on the ask from us, but one of the things that ask I might have is I really think that the um, access to employment is a really big piece. And if there was um, some way we could look at um, data and movement flows of people moving in and out of the area for employment. And, you know, if we could really do a deep dive, because I think it's important to understand who those people are, because I think one of the bigger impacts is going to be people um, who are, you know, moving for uh, work that they don't get paid a lot of money. I know this is a higher income area, but there still are people who have you know jobs that don't pay a lot and so i'd like to i have a good understanding of you know who's the the people that are impacted the most and where they're going work wise um that would be helpful for me and our handy dandy uh intern francisco is <laughs> taking notes furiously <laughs> so that may be one of your topics coming up quickly to do that that deep dive into and that research into that. So thank you so much, James. Who was next? I'm sorry, Penny. Phil. Phil Wu. Phil. Very, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Um, well, I'm, I'm just going to preview, uh, I, I think, a comment that, that I'll make um, at the September meeting. Uh, and I've almost forgotten. I've almost lost track of the thread uh, that you started with your question, Christine. But uh, having expressed that vulnerability, um, uh, you know, I tend to be a lumper uh, in, instead of someone who tends to break things apart into silos. And uh, by my way of thinking, um, and I'll just mention this as a preview, uh, the tool uh, that's called the Health Impact Assessment. Uh, and this will build a little bit on, on the comment that I made after Abe uh, delivered his presentation around the transportation related health impacts, which is taking a broader view of health impacts, uh, which would include things like access to employment, access to education, access to health services as being important determinants of health. And to the extent that we have a tool that integrates and aggregates all of those different uh, factors into something that can be thought of more holistically, then I think that is very beneficial when we think about the equity implications of uh, any transportation related decision that we're going to make. I had a conversation with Andy Dannenberg up at the University of Washington, who is a, a big guru of, uh, of uh, urban planning and, and transportation. Um, and he was with the Center for Disease Control for many, many years. Um, he forwarded me, um, a, and it's actually kind of old now, I think it comes from 2010 or 2011, but it's a, a health impact assessment uh, around San Francisco's road pricing project uh, about a decade ago. And it's very interesting. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but it's very interesting to see how they broke down health impacts and then factored in equity into that and it's a very uh, sort of integrated holistic way of looking at in that particular case road pricing so i, I think we could benefit uh, 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 in, in thinking along similar lines as a supplement to the processes that are already in place well i do want to have a conversation in september about yeah. the hia right so Really, maybe sending that document out to everyone ahead of time may be yep. the thing to do. Yep. We can all level set. We can all take a skim through it, see the different variables that they look at, and see how they organize it. Um, 
to base our conversation next month. Would you, Christine, would you like, would you and your team like to see that first uh, mm -hmm. to kind of vet it yeah. uh, before it goes out to the committee as a whole? Because you may decide that it's, yeah. you know, not helpful. You, right. Yes. Okay, so, so I'll please, do that. Please go ahead and send it to me. Okay, we'll do um, that. And I know from, from Abe that also Clackamas County has done some HIAs, some health impact assessments. Um, so, it, and I'm super interested in the tool Diana was mentioning before. So it sounds like maybe we're headed towards a tools discussion. What, yeah. what are some of the tools that we can use to help us in this analysis? So um, this, this is great. This is exactly the kind of expertise we want from this committee. So <laughs> thank you all so much. Um, so if folks have other ideas of tools, it's, it's off from the question that Christine put up there and that's okay. Um, we, <laughs> Uh, but um, if people have other tools that they've used that have helped to get to these discussions of um, you know, measuring equity and equitable outcomes, we want to hear about them for sure. Um, we have some of our own ideas for tools, but you're, you're really the experts in this field. So I think that's where we're at, Josh, is that there is so much information that we could go diving into, but we really need to frame it up, right? We need those decision-making questions and to look at the HIA and to look at this, the tools that are out there, then maybe we can come at it and say, okay, this is the exact kind of information that we need, whether we're taking a big broad swipe at it or really deep, you know, narrow chunks. So that's what I would suggest for September along with NEPA, and here I am into the next steps. How, how convenient with four minutes left in our awesome meeting here. I am going to share. Um, and take us into, um, again, here is our work plan. Um, I think we're gonna be in that iterative process of one and two. September, October, so that we're going to be in this iterative process of going back and forth and being able to really define the tools that we want to use and then deciding on the information um, that we are going to ask for. So then follow up on step one, um, move into step two performance measures, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act orientation, the NEPA. Um, we'll receive an overview of equity and mobility strategies from other programs. We may or may not have time for that in this next meeting, um, but also we want to focus on a bit of stakeholder and public engagement. So a little bit of everything in our next meeting over the next two meetings. Our next meeting is September 29th at 3.30 to 6 o'clock. And so I am, let's see, one more slide to say, uh, remember that the 45-day um, period is still going and that we still um, want people to participate in this open house and to be able to learn as much as possible. So here I have the English and the Spanish, both um, websites and invite you to be able to come and to uh, give us your input there. With that, um, we have gone through 70 slides. My God, I'm so proud of you guys. <laughs> and you're still standing. <laughs> Christine, may, and, I have, may I have a moment? Yes, you may. <laughs> so uh, I would just like to note for the couple of uh, uh, attendees who had their hands up the whole time, um, we did do public comment earlier in the meeting and I apologize that you missed it. And I urge you for the next meeting to really take a look at the agenda because we would love to hear your comments during the public comment period. So sorry it didn't work out this time, but um, we're not purposefully ignoring you. We're just trying to keep things on track. And then the second question I have, is there anyone here in our uh, committee or speakers who own this phone number that is showing up um, in our grid here, the 559 
940-5088 number. We're trying to identify who, if that number belongs to anybody here that maybe came in on their audio through telephone. Anybody recognize that as their number? Okay, all right. Well, we have Mr. It, be you know, it belongs to Dwight. Oh, oh very good. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dwight. Yeah, I, I said... I sent Christine uh, an email that, uh, yeah, uh, the change in time uh, meetings kind of created a bit of a challenge for me. Uh, the uh, later times worked a little better, but uh, I've managed. So I go from video to, to phone. So excellent. But it's, we'll it's all good. It. We'll recognize it next time. Thanks so much, Dwight. Well, and thanks for giving it out as you did, uh, Penny. I appreciate that now that. Uh, uh, everybody will have it, and, and I'll get phone calls in the middle of the night. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Happy to help out. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. Thanks. I'm going Thanks. back to mute. <laughs> Me too. Thanks, Christine. Okay. All right. Um, we, I, I just can't thank you guys enough. Um, we have come to the end of our time this evening. We have a lot more work to do. You've given us great guidance, and, and it, and right now is a lot of information giving, and then we will have expanded time for conversation. So I just want you to know that. I, I promise we will have deep, rich, engaging conversations. Thank you so much. We'll see you next month, and I truly appreciate everyone.